exploring the idea of an adult education program, and they're with us today, so we're delighted. Um, and so um, we'll just get going, and people will just wander in as they get ready. Pat, we're delighted you're here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Great. So um, I want to thank you for the invitation to share with you um, this morning. And um, I, I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for a couple reasons. It's always a pleasure to be here uh, with you at Covenant. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity uh, to reflect with you um, theologically on some important ideas. So it really helps me to think about these ideas. And in particular, I've been wrestling with this uh, the gun uh, question for a couple of years now, and so the opportunity to try to think about this theologically with you this morning has been a great aid to me, so I want to thank you for that, because it's helped me to clarify some of my own thinking about it and try to ask myself some fresh uh, questions about it. So I, I do want to deeply thank you for that opportunity. McCormick, it's like the salt and pepper people. Um, yeah, so, um, so we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about uh, guns uh, in the United States uh, today, um, and we're going to do this in two ways. Uh, I want to I want to highlight this. Um, the NRA has a bumper sticker uh, that they're very famous for, and the bumper sticker is that guns don't kill people. All right. And the idea here is that human agency and individual human beings who are either acting out of malice or out of stupidity or recklessness, that they're responsible for the killing of people. And I want to acknowledge that guns don't, by themselves as tools, pick themselves out of their cabinets and walk across the room and fire themselves at people. I think that that's... So guns by themselves don't kill people. What's also being implied in the text is that other instruments are used to kill people, and that's absolutely true. Um, people were murdering people um, in the past before uh, we had firearms, and uh, if we eliminate firearms, we won't eliminate murder. That's probably true. So both of those are probably true, and, and that's important. But it's also a mistake to think about a gun as a tool or instrument that exists outside of a social context or a social setting. And that is, guns don't just exist as something that it, that's sitting in somebody's cabinet in a household. The problem with guns in the United States is not that there are guns, it's that there are certain kinds of guns, and I don't mean assault rifles and hand pistols. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that guns exist within an economic and political and social structure. And their function in that structure can only be understood if we understand the larger societal reality. All right? And so, for example, one of the, one of the most common instruments for committing suicide in the developing world is chemical pesticides and fertilizers. And the people who commit suicide with chemical pesticides and fertilizers are impoverished females. Okay? Now, that's a very uncommon way for people to commit suicide in the United States. In the United States, the overwhelming tool that people use to complete suicides in the United States are firearms. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, handguns. All right. And the people who use these handguns to commit suicide are rural white males. Overwhelmingly. 30,000 people in this country die every year in firearm fatalities. And they are overwhelmingly white rural males. They're not impoverished, and they're not clinically depressed. They usually commit this suicide based on an event that happened to them within the last 24 hours. Now, the, the vast difference between the experience of impoverished women in developing world using chemical fertilizers and pesticides to ingest them to commit suicide. We can't 
can't just look at the, at the fertilizer, because fertilizer isn't presenting that threat to the master gardeners in Spokane, mm -hmm. right? It's not, okay? So to understand the fertilizer, we have to understand the larger social and economic context and the pressures on the people who are using this tool. All right. So, the NRA and others who are in support of what I'm going to call this morning widespread, unregulated gun ownership. And these are key elements. Widespread, unregulated gun ownership. That's different from just a gun by itself. Okay? Those who support widespread, unregulated gun ownership do not want us to look at the larger social, economic, and political context in which gun ownership is functioning in the American society in an exceptional way. If you were to discover tomorrow that 30,000 Americans die every year of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, you can bet your bottom dollar you would be banging on the doors of Congress to do something about this. Look what happened when a dozen people got sick from vaping. Right? Okay, so if chemical fertilizers were causing the death of 30,000 people in this country at the present time, if suddenly you woke up and you had 20,000 people a year killing themselves with chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and you had another 10,000 people a year killing one another with chemical fertilizers and pesticides, you would start looking at that issue. So, we're not just going to look at guns. We're going to look at guns in a larger social and economic context, right? Because what's going on here, all right, could go on with other things. But right now, in this country, in a way it's not happening in other places, it is going on with firearms. And there are reasons for that that don't have anything to do with the gun itself. They have something to do with the larger social, economic, and political realities in which we are living. So don't let anybody tell you that guns don't kill people. Because in this country, 30,000 people a year are killed by guns, all right? And they're not killed by chemical fertilizers and pesticides, or by vaping, right? So we need to look at this item inside that larger social and economic context. So what I'm going to be talking about this morning is Wasugo. Okay? Can everybody just say that? Wasugo. That's what we're going to talk about. We're not talking about gun control. We're talking about widespread, unregulated gun ownership. Okay? That's the problem. Okay? Because Wasugo does kill people. Okay? It kills 30,000 people a year. Right. So, I'm going to start by saying that in the U.S., we experience a unique, exceptional. Okay? And that's what we're going to look at here, is that it's exceptional. All right. If your child, if you discovered in you, in the, when you sent your first grader to school that Ralphie was not really doing well in school, you might assume, because you're Catholic or Presbyterian or Jewish, that Ralphie just needs to work a little bit hard. Okay? He's got some God-given gifts and he just, just needs to discipline himself. But if you could take I thought you could jump up a thousand feet and you could look at the whole Spokane community and you could identify 350 kids in the community who were having similar experiences to Ralphie and you don't see them if you just live in Ralph's house with him. Okay? If you notice that 350 kids were having the same problem and if the teachers who had each of them who had a Ralphie got in a room and said, well, my experiences with Ralphie is this. Well, oh, Jesus, that's my experience with Ralphie number two. And that's my experience with Ralphie 237. And that's my experience with Ralphie 350. What the heck do you think this is? I think it's dyslexia. Right? But you don't see dyslexia when you see one kid. Just like you don't see the gun problem when you don't look at this, Wasugo. Right? If you're just looking at one gun, if you're just telling one story, 
If you're, li if you're living on the level of anecdote, you're going to miss this whole thing. Okay? So we have to go to sociology and epidemiology. We have to go a thousand feet up. Then we spot dyslexia. And then with dyslexia, we don't tell Ralphie, work harder. Okay? We tell Ralphie, Ralphie, there's a wiring issue in your brain, and we know how to help you with that. Okay? And it's got nothing to do with willpower, and it's got nothing to do with evil, and it's got nothing to do with lazy. It's just a medical situation. And we're going to deal with it, not like it's a sin or a crime or willfulness. We're going to deal with it like it's a condition. Right? So, the United States has an exceptional level. Okay? I'm going to call this a fourfold plague of firearm violence. That is, when we look at ourselves as a high-income country, and we stand next to all the other kids in the class, we notice something about ourselves. Okay? One of the things we notice about ourselves is that we have an extraordinarily high level of gun violence. All right? An extraordinarily high, high level of lethal violence. Now, in Germany, there are just as many bad people as there are in Texas. In France, there are just as many reckless and stupid people as there are in Kentucky. Okay? We don't have, we don't have the, the brand or the ownership on evil people. Okay? And yet, in this country, when people engage in violence in this country, and they don't engage in general crime at any higher levels than, than the populations of other uh, high-income countries, and that is, there aren't more criminals in the population in Australia than there are in the United States, nor are there less. People commit burglary and un... un lethal crimes at about the same rate as they do in the U.S., right? There's some differences across the states, but in general, the, the, the level of criminal behavior is just about the same, okay? But the result of that criminal behavior in the U.S. produces death at a significantly higher rate. So, we've got the same amount of drunken Irishmen here that we've got any place else. We've got the same amount of mouths here that we've got anyplace else. We've got the same percentage of stupidity and irresponsibility and sinfulness here that we've got anybody else, anyplace else. But here, it produces a level of lethal destruction. So more people die of our stupidity and violence and malice and evil than they die in other countries. And that is the problem. Okay? The problem is not bad people or good people. The problem is not stupid people or smart people, reckless people or unreckless people. The problem is that you take the same population of stupid, bad, reckless people in your mix, and in this country it produces a much higher level of lethal violence. Okay? And what's unique about us? Okay? What's unique about us is that we have a fourfold plague of firearm violence. Now, Fourfold play. First, we lead the world in mass shootings. We've led the world in mass shootings for half a century. Okay? Nobody's going to take that gold medal away from us. All right? This is a shame. Okay? This is a mark of shame on our society. We lead the world. And it's not like, you know, we, there's not ups and downs, like Russia was ahead for a while and we caught up with them. No. We lead the world. And we lead the world in a phenomenal way with that. All right? Among those mass shootings, we, have a, we lead the world in school shootings. So we lead the world in mass shootings and in school shootings. For the sake of definition, we're going to describe a mass shooting as any shooting in which four or more people, aside from the shooter, are killed. Okay, so we lead the world in mass shootings and in school shootings. So that, that's the, the first element of our plague. The second element of our plague is that we have an exceptionally high rate of accidental deaths. Okay? At a conservative estimate, about 1,200 a year. Okay? So about 1,200 people a year die of accidental gun deaths in this country. Okay? And a striking um, percentage of those are young people. So we have the uh, mass shootings and the school shootings. We have the accidental deaths. And then we, we have rates of lethal um, homicide that are about five times what they should be if we compare ourselves with any other advanced um, industrialized nation. So five times. 
Five times not a smidgen. You know, five times not a statistically relevant. Five times, Jesus, H. Christ, what the hell just happened here? Okay? Five times is knock me down and run me over with an elephant. Right? So th there is no doubt that something is going on here. Right? So, um, and um, we have an unbelievably and exceptionally high rate of um, gun suicides. Uh, and firearm suicides, and that is you can. It's and, and this is very interesting because our suicide rate shouldn't be that high. Our suicide rate is about medium for other countries. But if you took out the gun suicides, all right, if you took out the gun suicides, our suicide rate would drop by two thirds. Right? Now, people say to you, well, you know, if somebody's committed to commit suicide, that they're they're just going to do it. The evidence suggests that that's simply not true. Okay? Over one half of the people who commit gun suicide in this country every year do not know that they're going to commit suicide 30 minutes before they do it. 30 minutes before they do it. Half the people who commit suicide don't know that they're going to do it. In Israel, where um, citizens, uh, uh, serve as soldiers, male citizens serve as soldiers from 18 to about 35. Um, soldiers had historically been allowed to take their rifles or weapons home with them over the weekend. Okay. What they discovered was that when they no longer let the soldiers do that, their suicide rate among that military population dropped in half. What it meant was that when the soldier or the part-time soldier had a suicidal ideation on a Saturday and he had the gun there with him, he killed himself. But if he had a suicidal ideation on Saturday and he wasn't going to get the gun back till Monday, about half of them didn't kill themselves. So they reduced it by that. So simply taking it out of the house had that kind of an effect. So. Um, we, have, we have a fourfold um, plague of firearm violence that is, and this is the one word we have to stay with, exceptional. Okay? Because that's what those who support widespread um, unregulated gun ownership won't look at. They want to look at the individual gun and the individual narrative. What they don't want to look at is the fact that your town has a hell of a lot more dyslexia than any other town in the valley. And we want to know why. That's the problem. The problem is the exceptional. Okay? The problem is not one person killing another person with a gun who could have killed somebody with a knife. Not one person taking their life with a gun who could have taken their life with pesticide. The problem is we have way too many people when you compare us with anybody else in the neighborhood. And it's the exceptional. And the exceptional is about this. Okay? It's about that. All right. So, we have a unique fourfold plague of firearm violence. Now, I'm going to use the word plague for a couple of reasons here. All right. First reason that I'm going to use it is I want us to get out of um, an individualist crime punishment paradigm here. I grew up in the Catholic Church, and when I was a child in the Catholic Church, um, uh, if a person, and we used this word, committed suicide, okay? Commit is the word we use for sin and crime. If a person committed suicide, they could not be buried in the church grounds because the church believed that they had committed the sin of despair and did not have faith in God. Okay? Now, that's a punitive, individualistic, crime-based understanding, which is completely misinformed because it doesn't understand what's going on in the suicide victim at all. Right? But it's a paradigm. Right? In my own family... I have two suicide victims who were not buried in the church because of this. Right? Now, today, the Catholic Church recognizes that people who commit suicide or people who attempt suicide are either experiencing a desperate need for attention or love or support or compassion, or they are clinically depressed or they experience that they have very few options in front of them. And so, to the best of my knowledge, no Catholic priest or bishop today would ever deny the victim of a suicide a Christian burial or the support that their family members uh, need. And see what happened there? We shifted from a paradigm. The paradigm was individualistic guilt and punishment to a medical model. Right? Now, I'm going to argue that if we look at the four Gospels, 
Jesus' primary, primary understanding of human sinfulness follows much more, and this is even clearest in Luke's Gospel, follows much more what I would call a medical model. He thinks of sinners as people who are suffering from an illness, and he thinks of sin as a disease. He doesn't say that people aren't responsible for some other diseases or don't share some responsibility, but his primary response is medicinal. And that is, how can we help people out of this situation into another situation? All right? Not how can we identify them as a sinner and blame them and shame them and punish them for it. Now, so I want to use the plague language because I want to shift out of this individual crime punishment model. All right? uh, and because that crime punishment model tends to um, it tends to other the victim. And by other, I mean to separate them out from the tribe, to sacrifice or to scapegoat them, and to render them as someone, someone who is beyond the pale of our suffering or our compassion. And we see this happen with the victims and uh, even the perpetrators of gun violence in a variety of different ways. So we assume that every person who commits gun homicide is a fundamentally different kind of person than you and I are. And that is, we assume that, that we would not do this kind of thing, and the kind of person who would kill another person is a different kind of person. Well, like they say in Porgy and Bess, it turns out it ain't necessarily so. Okay? It, it, turns out, it turns out that I have a very high level of confidence that my undergraduates at Gonzaga are not going to commit suicide, or homicide, because I know what socioeconomic class they come from, and that they're aspiring to stay in. And that as long as they stay in that economic, socioeconomic class, the chances of them committing homicide with a gun are extraordinarily low. Right? So I have confidence. Not because I think that they're virtuous and sweet and kind. I think poor people are virtuous, sweet and kind as well. But I know that the chances of my undergraduates committing homicide are like the chances of them getting obesity. Right? Their social class protects them from that. Right? So I know that that situation is going on. So. When we look at the situation, we have to look at the, at the, at the big picture. So I, I want us to shift away from this crime individualistic model. So how do we see this model working with guns? Right? The NRA and those who support the NRA have a theological vision in which they say that mass shooters are monsters. Okay? That they're basically, they are, they are creatures of... of unknowable evil, right? Now, I understand affectively how that narrative appeals to an audience, particularly when somebody goes up to a tower hotel in Las Vegas and then showers bullets and kills dozens or hundreds of people, right? I understand that. That looks like an absolutely monstrous act, all right? However, the vast majority of homicides committed with guns in this country are committed by people who are on drugs, or intoxicated, or enraged by an incident that happened to them 30 minutes ago. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't sociopaths and psychopaths in the community. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that sociopaths and psychopaths could not explain 10,000 gun homicides a year. They couldn't. The, the, that would not explain the reality. Because, as I said before, France has psychopaths, and Germany has sociopaths. All right? But they don't have this. So, something else is going on here. So we need to move away from that individualistic model and we need to, to look at what else is going on. The other reason I'm going to use the word plague is because in the Bible, and we're going to get to this in just a minute, in the Bible the ten plagues that are visited upon Egypt are, they are the result of structural violence. That is, the plagues that occur in Egypt are the fruit of the Pharaoh's own structural violence against the land, against the Egyptians, and against the Hebrews. The clearest way we know this is that his first <coughs> act of violence is to slaughter the Hebrew children. Okay? And the last plague is the slaughtering of the Egyptian children. So the violence that the, that the Pharaoh sends out into the world is the harvested upon him and his own household. The biblical authors are really saying that a plague is an expression and the fruit of structural violence. And what I'm trying to say is that instead of looking at our exceptional rates of gun violence in the society as the fruit of the presence of malicious criminal people 
or our accidents as the fruit of people who are stupid, they don't know how to take care of a gun, or um, our suicides as the fruit of mentally ill people. See what we did in each of those categories? What we did is we demonized a group of people, we separated them out for ourselves, well, I'm not a criminal, I'm not stupid or reckless, and I'm not mentally ill, so I don't have to worry, I can have a gun. Right? So that process of othering groups of people, right, um, then uh, for, allows us not to address the real issue. What is really causing this exceptional high rate of violence in our community? Right? And so, if we think of it as a plague, then we can ask ourselves, what is the structural violence that is behind this level of, 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 uh, of firearm violence? We can ask ourselves, what are the structural problems? And we can also think of this as a societal problem and not an individual problem. So we're not going to try to fix Ralph and what we now see as his dyslexia by using a response we would use in, uh, on an individual. We try to use a systemic response. We try to figure out a systemic response. Now, the other thing that we need to look at about our fourfold plague of firearm violence in this country is that along with that, we also have an exceptional obstinate defense of widespread unregulated gun ownership. And that is, we don't just have the problem, we have an almost apocalyptic unwillingness to look at it. Right? And, and that is, so there is a level of moral blindness in our society um, that, uh, that is stunning. So, and it, as I said, look what happened after just a dozen reports of vaping issues. Okay? Look at the firestorm that broke out about that. Right? Look at our concern about the coronavirus. Okay? 30,000 people every year. Can you imagine? Just, just imagine this. Imagine that an Islamic terrorist was shooting our children in our schools. What would our response to that be? Right? If 90 children got killed a year in our schools by Islamic terrorists, what would the level of our response be? Because we love a villain. We love an opponent. And because we know how to respond to that, we're going to get to why we know how to respond to that, but imagine the level of response, right? I remember thinking in the wake of 9-11, that if I were a terrorist, I would never attempt the plane trick again. Because that was a one trick, you know, uh, trick. You, you could do that one time. The only reason that they succeeded was that nobody ever expected them to fly the planes into buildings. But once everybody expected it, if you were on a plane and I was a terrorist and I tried to break down the pilot's door, you would have nothing to lose by attacking me. Because so there's no reason for you to show any restraint in that situation. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, if I were a terrorist now, I'd go after playgrounds. If I wanted to scare the living bejesus out of Americans, I'd start going after playgrounds. I have to tell you that 19 years later, I think it wouldn't have worked. I think we've been going after playgrounds for 20 years. And... I think the terrorists see that. I think they look at that and go, well, shooting their children won't do any good because they won't even protect themselves from that. Why would they protect themselves from us? Now, I do think it would be different if we could figure out that it was an Arab or a Mexican who did that. I think our response would be different. But, but basically, <coughs> what we have here is not just this fourfold plague, but we have a level of moral blindness and resistance that is stunning, right? That's just stunning. And evidence of that is that in the last 20 years, there have been mass shootings in uh, several other countries, and the immediate response to these mass shootings in other um, high-income countries that are very much like us, New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, Germany, Finland, every one of those other HICs, every one of them passed national gun regulation within six months of the event. 
So the fact that, that we have these rituals occur almost every week of shock, okay, denial, paralysis, and then defense of the status quo. That it is a ritual as predictable uh, as any other ritual that we engage in. And that it's an accelerating ritual that honestly, I started following this issue a couple of years ago. I got to a point in the last six months, I just stopped writing them down. Because they were happening so frequently. And there was, it, because it was like, you would say to yourself, was that story yesterday or was that three days ago? You know, it's that level. So, so one of the other questions that we've got here is not just that there is this phenomenon, this exceptional phenomenon, but that there is a level of moral blindness to this issue that's incomparable to, to what our neighbors are doing, but also to what we would do on any other issue. Now, I want to suggest that you, to use biblical language, I want to use, I want to use two examples that I think illustrate the dynamic that's going on here. One example of this kind of blindness, the classic example that we see in the, in the Hebrew Bible, is Pharaoh's response to the ten plagues. If we look at Pharaoh's response to the ten plagues, it mirrors almost exactly Congress's response to shootings. Right? First, shock and horror that this has happened. Frogs, he says. Okay. Locusts, he says. Bloody rivers, he says. Oh my God, of course we're going to address this. Okay. And then he makes a promise. We will absolutely let the Hebrews go. And then he thinks about what it would cost him to lose this slave class of people. And what the disadvantage would be to the ruling elites if they were to change their position on this. And invariably, ten times in the narrative, he says, yeah, not going to do it. Okay? If we look at Congress's response, I think we see striking similarities there. Oh my God, another shooting. We have to pray for these people. This is terrible. We have to do something about this. And then, they think about their position. Well, if I run against, if I run in favor of gun control, the NRA is going to have a candidate in the primaries. It's going to knock me out of my seat. Honest to God, I like my job as much as anybody. Okay, but it's not like these men and women can't get another job. I, is there an unemployment problem among former representatives of Congress? <laughs> Are there corporations that won't hire people like that? Did I miss something? You know, is there, among the homeless in Spokane that we're worried about, are there a lot of former congressional reps and senators? You know? So they, they've already entered the ruling elite political class. They're never going to fall out of that class. Okay. I mean, occasionally one of them goes to prison, but they never go to prison. <laughs> it never happens. And yet they're so terrified. They're so terrified of the chance of losing that job that they have for the last 30 or 40 years invariably chosen their own political and class advantage. And we have to say that the funding that's coming through the NRA to them to support them from the gun manufacturers, that's just enlightened self-interest. So what we see in Congress is exactly what we see in the Pharaoh's obstinance. But that's not the only obstinance, right? The Bible also uses the term hard-hearted people. And it uses this term repeatedly to describe a characteristic in the people of Israel, which applies just as much to Catholics, right? Okay. Uh, and that is, the prophets consistently criticized their own community for a willful blindness and deafness to the command of God. To be hard-hearted is to resist the overwhelming evidence of God's call in your life. Okay? And it is almost always characterized by a callous indifference to widows, orphans, and strangers. Right? And that is, what is significantly characteristic of the hard-hearted people is a moral blindness, an unwillingness to hear the command of God, and a deafness and indifference to the sufferings of the poor and the widow and the orphan and the stranger. And what is also characteristic of the hard-hearted people is that they often, almost always, wrap themselves in a self-righteous religiosity. Now, when we look at gun support in the United States, 
we see many of these same characteristics. Right? We see a group of people, they tend to be more religious than the general population, and they tend to see themselves as at war with the threat of atheistic secularism and the decline of society. Okay? So they see themselves as more profoundly and superiorly religious than other people. The support of widespread unregulated gun ownership allows them to be completely deaf to the suicide death of 20,000 people a year and to the homicide death of 10,000 people a year. And it allows them not to notice that the overwhelming majority of people killed in gun homicides in this country are black males. And it allows them to overlook the fact that the children, both in their schools and in their homes, live at a higher risk of, of death and dismemberment than the children in the schools and homes of Norway or Germany or France or Great Britain. Which means that they effectively allow their children to be terrorized. Now some of us are of an age when we remember hiding under school desks from the threat of nuclear missiles that might come from Cuba or the Soviet Union. And 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years later, we look back at that and we say, see, that's what we suffered when we were kids. Our children today are not worried about missiles coming from Cuba or from the Soviet Union. They, they are worried about not being protected in their homes or their schools from people who have weapons of war. Okay? They are worried about that. And they live with that. And we've had those shootings in this town, right? We've had those shootings in this town, and we know about this. My daughter was in a school with an armed shooter, an active shooter, during high school, right? So, this is a reality. Now, that hardness of heart that's not moved by the terrorism, by, by the terrorizing of our own children, that's not moved by the slaughter of minorities, and that's not moved by a sea of avoidable suicides, it's hard not to see that as hard hearted So, I want to look at this issue, not so much in terms of statistics, and in terms of, um, you know, the way, the paradigms we normally use, I want to look at this issue as a religious question. I want to ask, be, because I've turned to these metaphors of the pharaonic obstinance and the hard-hearted people. I want to ask about this issue in terms of religion. Okay? And I'm going to do that for a variety of reasons. The first reason I'm going to ask about this question in terms of religion is that the United States is unique among high-income in countries or <coughs> post-industrial democracies. It's unique in that it has an extraordinarily high level of religiosity. Extraordinary. Now, that level of religiosity is always dropping, and we, of a certain age, experience that it's not passing on as much to the successive generations, right? So, we certainly experience decline in that. But if you compare us to Germany, if you compare us to France, if you compare us to Italy, where I went to grad school, where the Pope lives, right? If you compare us to all of these places, we have phenomenal levels of religiosity. We also have phenomenal levels of gun ownership and phenomenal levels of gun deaths. Okay? And I want to make a suggestion that these things are not independent items, that there's a relationship between them. I want to also suggest not only are we awash in faith and awash in firearms in the United States, I want to suggest that at the same time, that those who own and defend widespread unregulated gun use tend to exhibit what could only be called a religious level of zeal for their cause. I admit that there is a Second Amendment which defends the right of a well-regulated militia, okay, which is what the Constitution says, right? I admit that there is a Second Amendment, and I admit, I admit that all amendments have been passed by the American people and have some weight and importance. But we should also remember, while we're remembering the sacredness of our founders, that they had no problem with slavery. Okay? And that lots of them made slave babies. So, let's not, let's not sacralize this thing out of control here. We should also remember that half the population didn't have the franchise to vote for 150 years. So, 
let's not sacralize that, in, that moment in history, okay? That was not a good moment if you were a Native American. It was not a good moment if you were an African American. It was not a good moment if you were female. And it wasn't a good moment if you were poor or landless. But if you were in that small cluster made up by Tommy Jefferson and his friends, then it was a very good <laughs> moment, okay? But I admit, I acknowledge that. But we should pay attention to the fact, the fact that this is not a right so deeply or vigorously defended by any other post-industrialized democratic society. So it's kind of like if we had a right to pimples and nobody else did, you might wonder after a while why we had a right to pimples and nobody else did, you know? <laughs> I mean, and then it's, it's like, it may not be given by God. Like, did God only choose Americans to know about this right? Like, did God only think that people from the United States needed this right? Were there no bad people in England, no bad people in France, no bad people in Germany? No. So, yes, it is a right. It is in the Constitution. We need to honor the Constitution. However, we have things in the Constitution called amendments. And the reason that we have amendments in the Constitution is because thinking people, the majority of thinking people, have from time to time said, yeah, you need to fix this. Yeah, there's a problem with it. Yeah, we're not done yet. Okay? So the fact that it was there in the beginning, like protection of slavery was there in the beginning, like exclusion of females was there in the beginning, is no evidence that it ought to be there always. In the Constitution does not mean God-given. However, I don't know how many of you watched the State of the Union address, um, and, I'll, and you can only guess at what my favorite part was, but it has something to do with Nancy Pelosi. Um, but, but in the State of the Union address, the President was able to garnish uh, an overwhelmingly powerful, evocative response when he tied together the freedom of religion, which is an extraordinary thing that he would be defending, all right? Uh, the freedom of religion, okay, and the freedom to own guns. These were the two sacred cornerstones and the foundation, which explains why then when he gave a list of our founding fathers, why on earth showed up in that list? Okay? Um, right, and the conquest or the genocide of the West showed up in that list, all right? So, um, so Mr. Trump was explaining to his audience that there are two sacred pillars uh, of the Constitution, and they are... Uh, freedom of church-going people to have guns to kill people who don't go to church, or something like that. So, so, and the evocative response that that got from his audience was ex extraordinarily powerful. Right? So I want to say that not only is this a religious country, which is also a gun-owning country, I want to say that gun-owning is defended with a religious level of zeal. I also want to say that a number of the arguments used in defense of guns are religious arguments. And I want to say that the concentration among gun owners it corresponds to the concentration among a certain kind of religiosity, right? A certain kind of religion. So I'm, I'm going to look at this as a, as a religious issue, right? Now, I believe that underlying the defense, not of guns, the defense of widespread, unregulated gun ownership, that defense, that underlying that defense are a series of religious myths. Now, because I disagree with these myths, I'm going to call them heresies. So, one man's myth is another girl's heresy, right? But, so I'm, you, but you already know where I stand, so I'm not giving anything away here, right? But I'm going to suggest that there are four religious beliefs, okay, that underlie um, the, the defense of widespread, unregulated gun ownership in our society. The first of these beliefs is, and this is something I had to go to grad school to hear about, okay? <laughs> Manichaean dualism, okay? So, dualism. Every time a prof says dualism in the classroom, you know what the prof really means is spit, okay? So, so it's a bad thing. Dualism is like colonialism. It's never, it's never a hero in the narrative. But basically, Manichaean dualism means this. In nearly every religious tradition, there are embedded myths which try to explain reality. And in nearly every religious tradition, one of the primary myths is a dualistic myth, which divides the world into good and bad people. All right? And the solution for the existence of bad people 
in Manichaean dualistic myths is the annihilation or destruction of the bad people. Right? And that is, when we look at ancient religious myths with the rise of uh, civilizations in the Mediterranean and in Mesopotamia, what, one myth that we hear, which we're going to get into in just a minute, over and over again, has the hero creating a safe empire, society, world, or country by destroying the villain. That this is the, one of the oldest myths there in the society. But before we get to the destruction, the first stage of the myth is the division of the world into good people and bad people. Now, the pervasiveness of Manichaean dualism in American society and many, many parts of Christianity, it certainly has been pervasive within my own Catholic tradition in many ways, right? Manichaean dualism starts with the assumption that there are good people and bad people. Right? Now, once you get to that place, if there are people that are categorically bad, didn't just make a mistake, didn't just take the wrong path. If you, mis if you agree that there are people who are categorically bad, then they have to be removed, which is the second myth, the myth of redemptive violence. Right? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells a parable about an owner who discovers that he has weeds among his wheat in the field. Now, the disciples' solution to this problem is to go through the fields and to kill all the weeds. Because the assumption is that weeds are fundamentally different from wheat, and that therefore they don't have a right to exist. Now, botanists in the room, or master gardeners in the room, would tell us that a weed is just a great plant who's in the wrong place, right? <laughs> a weed is just a plant who has been thrown out of harmony with her local environment and doesn't have enough checks and balances, okay? So, the wheat is not essentially different from the wheat, right? Kudzu would be a southern example. It thrived very well in Japan, but when you introduced it into Georgia, it became a homicidal killer, right? And, and the reason that it happened was that there weren't checks and balances. Jesus responds to the temptation of the disciples by saying to them that that's not their job. Their job is not to, to kill the weeds, because in the process, they will end up slaughtering a lot of wheat. My response to Manichaean dualism, it's not mine, I borrow from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, the Russian novelist, has a line which is often quoted. And he says that the line between good and evil crosses, cuts through every human heart. Meaning that there is no heart that has no evil and that is only good. There is no free zone of evil. There are no communities, states, or societies. There are no churches. Okay? I was once on a plane with a woman from another church, and she told me that she had left Catholicism because um, she wanted to join a church that didn't have gays. And I was stunned, first of all, because I, we, have, we have such an anti-gay attitude in the church that I thought, my God, we weren't hateful enough for you. And, uh, <laughs> and my second response was, and you found that church? And, and I remember it when the AIDS epidemic broke out in the, in the 80s, and I was uh, in school in Rome, I remember so many of my African and um, Mexican friends telling me that that would never be a problem in their country, because they didn't have homosexuals in Africa, and they didn't have homosexuals in Mexico. And of course, my Irish colleagues told me, that's just not something we do in Ireland. And I was like, really? That's amazing. Okay, so, anyway. So, the idea that you can contain evil by segregating or selecting a group of people and separating them out from the general population. That is an, an, an I'm going to, let me say this correctly, that is an anathema to Christian faith. Okay? Genesis 1, let us make them in the image of God, in the divine image, let us make them, male and female, let us make them. Every human being made in the image and likeness of God. We were told this morning that God looks at creation and says that it's tov, it's good, very good, right? In the first, uh, in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, God uh, praises creation seven times. In the Bible, that means whoop ti do. okay? Um, so, seven times, let's not make a mistake, not three and a half, not 4.2, seven times. That's a fullness statement, okay? That means all of creation is good. All of creation has been made by God, all of creation has been blessed by God, 
all of creation. Uh, God is in awe of all creation. There are no bad parts of creation. There's no evil in creation. There's just there's all creation. And we don't have to go to Solzhenitsyn. We can go to Martin Luther. We're all sinners. Everybody's a sinner. Okay. You may not agree with Augustine on, on every other thing, but on this point, he and Luther are pretty much in congruence, and that is, there are no innocents abroad. Okay? We're all sinners. So, the idea that we could segregate the community into evil people and into good people, it is a heresy. And it is a dangerous heresy. Okay? And the reason it's dangerous is because of this, the myth of redemptive violence. Because once you've established that there are bad people and good people, okay, and you are, of course, in the good people, right? Once you made that establishment, then it is, it is just an inch away from saying, well, then we have to round them up or we have to kill them. Those are our two options. We either exile them or we slaughter them. Those are the only two options. Because they're not really human, because they're not really with us. Now, the myth of redemptive violence is one of the most powerful myths in the world. And it is a myth we can track back 5,000 years to Samaria, and it is a myth that appears in every John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Mel Gibson, and uh, uh, what's his name, Liam Neeson, like Taken 32, or whatever that one is now, right? It's in every movie. And honestly, watch any State of the Union address. A Democrat or a Republican, Trump or Obama, if he wants both sides of the room to stand up, he praises the warrior. It's the simplest trick in the world. You can't get the room to stand up for teachers. You can't get them to stand up for nurses. You can't get them to stand up for doctors. But you get a boy with a chest full of ribbons, and you can get the most left-leaning Democrat and the most zealous Republican to get teary-eyed and stand up. It wasn't a mistake. They brought home a warrior at the State of the Union address, bedecked with medals of combat. This is the oldest myth there is. It is the reason why the overwhelming majority of people who run for the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress discover that the easiest pathway to political power in the United States is either to be in the military or to be a prosecutor. That is, to have a reputation for separating bad people from good people and for inflicting punishment on the bad. That is the thing that makes us teary-eyed and soft-hearted at any age. They don't show us the babies of the suffering in Africa. They don't show us the victims of coronavirus. If they want us to weep, they show us a warrior. Now, that is to let you know how embedded that myth is in our system. Okay? That myth, that's in our bones. It's in the air we breathe. It's, it, there, it is an unavoidable thing. <coughs> Why, for God's sake, would you not give a first-class seat on an airplane to an emergency room nurse? Why would you not do that? Why would you give it to anybody who has ever served in the military as your first right? That is a ritual that we're enacting in that moment. Right? So, the myth of redemptive violence, and both of these are embraced in a very popular Hollywood myth called frontier justice. And in frontier justice, bad people ride into town with black hats, okay? Uh, and they threaten the community, mostly the women folk. And then a good man, goes into the basement and straps on a six-gun and comes out and levels the city, okay? This is the story of High Noon. It's the story of the shootout the OK Corral. It's the story of every Western that's ever been made. It is the story John Wade made a living off of for 60 years, okay? It is an American story that never goes away. Right? And the myth of redemptive violence is the frontier justice. It is also a story that is profoundly masculinist or chauvinist, right? Because it's always the guy with the gun. Although Grace Kelly did pick up a rifle in I knew, right? It's always the guy with the gun defending women folk, okay? So the transgender people don't get into their bathroom, right? So it's always that guy, right? And it is a deeply racist narrative, okay? When I was a child, nobody wanted to be the Indian, right? Nobody wanted to play the Indian. And, when, and, and in this narrative, 
Uh, the other is a racially other person. One of the reasons we are largely indifferent to the death of 7,000 black males a year by gun homicide is because they're black males. That's one of the reasons why we're indifferent to it. It's one of the reasons why it's almost impossible to garner attention. So it is a chauvinistic or masculinist and racist idea. There's also um, the support for this um, widespread unregulated gun ownership is based on an, an, an idolatry. Okay? And what do I mean by idolatry? I mean that people, when people speak about guns and the defense of widespread unregulated gun ownership, they speak about their guns in ways you would never speak about your blender. Right? They speak about their guns in ways you would hardly even ever speak about your supercharged red sports car. Though that approaches what the gun has, right? They speak about their guns the way you would speak about large genitals. Right? That's the way they speak about it. They speak about it as a sacred object. Right? As a sacred and holy object, and a sacred and holy object which must be given reverence. Right? Think of the awe that is given to guns. Charlton Heston says that you will have to take this, this gun, which he steals from a very bad Hollywood film, right? He says you have you, you take this gun from my from my dead fingers, my dead hands. Really? I said, this is the thing, this is the thing you're gonna defend the last. Not your children. Not your grandchildren, not the safety of your community, not your right to freedom of speech, not any of these things, but this, this totem, this object will be defined. So the level of sacredness. But the other thing I want to point out about idolatry is that in the Bible, idolatrous objects are often boundary objects for the crossing of a political reality. What do I mean by that? I mean that they stand for and they represent the defense of a status quo or a social order. When the Hebrews attempt to, to melt down a golden calf in the desert, the reason that they want this is that Moses has them abandoning the whole structure of empire. And they are terrified about moving out of empire and trying to develop a more just or humane or equitable society that won't be anything like the empires or the kingdoms around them. So the creation of the golden calf is an attempt for them to return to Egypt, to get back into Egypt. It, it's not, you and I think of these idols from the ancient world as little totems that people have on their windowsills. You know, I'm going to say a prayer, St. Anthony, turn around, turn around, I hope that I will find something, something lost will now be found, or whatever that is, right? <laughs> so we think of idols as like little creatures, but that's not what they are. In the Bible, idols are symbols, gateway symbols, for the protection of the status quo. In the same way, the Hebrews worshipped or idolized kingship when they went to Samuel and begged him for a king, even though he had overwhelming evidence. He has like a New York, op -ed, New York Times op-ed piece on the reasons why you shouldn't have a king. Mm -hmm. And even after he's given them all the evidence, he goes, yeah, 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 that's fine. We just want a king. Okay? So the king is a totem. He's a symbol of the political and economic and social order that they want. And that order is the hierarchy and the enslavement of empire. By the same token, the gun does not exist in a political vacuum. It represents a boundary. The possession of the gun individually or the possession of widespread possession of the gun in society means that people who are interested in protecting the status quo will be able to do it. Now, there's no factual evidence that they will, in fact, be able to do it with their guns. Okay? There's no evidence that they'll be able to do that. But it is a belief, not based on evidence, right, that it will protect them. It will protect them from the threat of black bodies coming into their neighborhood, or brown bodies crossing the border, uh, or other bodies threatening them in some way. But the gun is a totem of something political and economic. And in that way, it represents idolatry. Because there is an irrational faith in the ability of this metal object to defend me from a future that is coming. Right? And then finally, racism. You cannot think about gun ownership in the United States and gun regulation and gun possession in the United States without thinking about race. Okay. One of the simplest and easiest examples of this is that the state of California under Ronald Reagan began to move in favor of gun ownership the moment Ronald Reagan thought of the Black Panthers as having guns. 
Okay, that was the link. The second he thought about the Black Panthers having guns, the second they began to go out in public with rifles, the Republican governor of, of California said, yeah, maybe we need a little gun control here. So gun control means making sure that one class of racial group of people has the guns and other people don't. Okay. The use of guns, the, 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 the spreading of guns, these are not black people who are manufacturing guns. Right? These are white people who are manufacturing guns and they're selling them to people who are going to kill black people. All right? The flow of guns, we talk all about the wall. The wall, one thing the wall won't do, but should, but could do, is stop the flow of U.S. guns into Mexico. The level of violence in Mexico is directly related to the sale of U.S. guns and the importing of those guns into Mexico, which is something the president and most politicians never talk about. Right? So we talk about drugs coming up here and horrible people coming up here, but somebody you know, at unregulated gun markets are selling these guns knowingly to people and shipping them to Mexico. Right. So, great. Now, what are some theological, just to wrap up, what are some theological responses to that? I believe that in order to address um, the gun issue in the United States, we have to recognize this as an exceptional phenomenon, and it has to be addressed as an exceptional phenomenon, and not just as the ownership of one gun by one person. I also believe that, that the defense of this exceptional ownership of guns is supported by a couple of religious beliefs that we, as religious people, ought to address. And that is, we ought to have a response to Manichaean dualism. And our response is, we do not believe that some people are evil and other people are good. Now, I realize that that notion is deeply embedded in us, but let me just show you an example of how that notion was used in other situations. Today, at the present time, there are about 20,000 Americans who die in car accidents or fatalities. Right? Fifty years ago, there were 40,000 people a year who died in car accidents. And that's when we had a smaller population and fewer people on the road. So this is a phenomenal change. Okay? When people began to suggest, like Ralph Nader, that we needed seatbelts or safety procedures, or we needed to change highway speed limits, or we needed to change <coughs> ramps or other kinds of things, the response of both the car manufacturers and the, and the political uh, leaders was, this is the problem of stupid drivers. Okay? You're not going to fix stupid drivers by putting on seatbelts. It turned out, yes. Yes. So now, we have 20,000 people a year who are alive, who may be stupid, okay? that, that, that's possible, but they're alive. Okay? And, and so, they come home from their jobs, or they, they cook for their children, they're alive. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm stupid at least three times a day, right? So, th this, is a, this is an occasional experience for me, right? So, what did we do? We cut, phenomenally, the number of people who die in car accidents by stopping doing a moral analysis of the people who drive and saying that they were reckless or stupid or other kinds of things. And we figured out scientific and medical and technical solutions to these problems. And the insurance companies got behind some of these and figured out what children who were 16 could do when they were in the first year of driving and what they couldn't do. And what were the things that made their behavior more reckless and what were the things that made their behavior less reckless. And by doing that, we made changes. And that is by shifting away from a moral analysis of the individual to a social analysis and by paying attention to the sufferings and by saying, you know, 40,000 people a year is just too many to die in car accidents. Let's see if we can't cut that number in half. By doing that, we made a shift. 50 years ago in the United States and around the world, the overwhelming majority of Christian churches supported the death penalty. Okay. 50 years ago. Catholics supported it, Methodists supported it, Uni well, Unitarians, who knows about them for sure. But, um, <laughs> and Quakers probably not. But, but your, your mainstream people, your, your, you know, your burgers and soda people, they, they all supported the death penalty. And at the end of the day, the reason that almost all of those churches shifted away was that their new position is now that the death penalty should never be used except in those cases when it is absolutely necessary to take a life to defend the life of the larger community. And that's the only time you can use it, okay? Which effectively means you can't use it, right? Because we can control a population once we put them in jail. Uh, accepting the occasional drug lord who tunnels six miles out and, and escapes, <laughs> but accepting that. But, but generally, we can control it. Now, what happened in that? We were willing to tolerate 
our churches, were willing to tolerate the execution of other human beings because we believed, as Thomas Aquinas said in the 13th century, that some people are beasts, which is the 13th century equivalent of some people are monsters. <coughs> Invariably, Christian churches over the last 50 years have said, we don't believe that anymore. Okay, we believe that people do horrible things. And we believe that horrible actions should have consequences. But we don't believe that there are monsters in our midst. We don't believe that. And so, once you don't believe that somebody's a monster, you don't have any justification for taking their life unless they're directly threatening your life. And the shift in the death penalty in the United States and around the world, in Christian churches, has invariably been because we've rejected Manichaean dualism. We don't accept it anymore. Okay. Yes, what Ralph did was monstrous and horrible, and he needs to be held responsible for it. But he didn't stop being a human being, and we're not going to stop acting as if he is a human being. He didn't become a kangaroo as a result of this. He's still a human being. And so there are minimum rules that we're going to have to practice. I believe that we reject Manichaean dualism more and more in more places. The myth of redemptive violence is the <coughs> antithesis of the Christian narrative. Okay? At the heart of the Christian narrative, in the crucifixion, Jesus, hanging from the cross, says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I believe that he's saying that because they believed, in that moment, that by killing a criminal, they could make their society more safe, or more pure, or more holy that that's what they believe, and that that was their flaw. And that Jesus is really saying, you don't know that the one you're actually trying to please, the one you're trying to worship, is the very one you're killing in this moment. You don't know what you're doing. And I believe that that's the criticism of the myth of redemptive violence. Every college student knows the myth of redemptive violence. They get a roommate who they think sucks, okay? <laughs> and they find a solution, they go to the dorm chief and they say, I can't live with Ralph, make Ralph go away. And then they discover in their second semester that they live with Jimmy, and it turns out, Jimmy sucks too. Right? <laughs> and then they shift roommates again, and after a while, even a relatively slow undergraduate discovers, I wonder if I suck. <laughs> as, the, as the Arab saying is, perhaps it's not the road that bothers you as much as the stone in your shoe. Right? And that's so... The myth of redemptive violence is based on the idea that we can make our world safe by exiling or slaughtering those who are not like us. That we believe in this myth is evident from the fact that we have built the largest prison system in the world. And the, under the belief that if we rounded up enough people and put them behind bars, we would be living in a better society. As I said, Frenchmen, and Germans, and Russians, and Poles, and Mexicans, they have just as many bad people as we do, and they don't do this. Not the way we do it. So, the myth of redemptive violence is the antithesis of the Christian idea. So when we think about this gun issue in the future, I ask you to think these two things. Ask yourself not about guns individually and their ownership. Ask yourself about the exceptional rate and what it's based on, and whether you agree with the myths that support it. And I hope you don't. Thank you.